Welcome to Movies That Matter, the podcast about recent films going above and beyond the call of box office returns to boldly explore a social issue affecting people's lives. I'm Nicole Finari. And I'm Gary Shellhammer. And what movie are we going to overanalyze this week? White Boy Rick. Okay, so set in 1980s Detroit at the height of the crack epidemic and the war on drugs, White Boy Rick is based on the true story of a blue-collar father, played by Matthew McConaughey, and his teenage son, played by newcomer Richie Merritt, Rick Worshey, becomes an undercover police informant and later a drug dealer before he's abandoned by his handlers and sentenced to life in prison. What did you think? Uh, wow. I have followed this story for a long time. Okay. Because, as we'll get into later, there's some really cool things about White Boy Rick and some overturning of laws that happened recently. But overall, as a movie, I was so disappointed in this movie. I... I can't wait to, to like, talk about the true story stuff because this movie just didn't give you any context or understanding about anything in this movie. Like, you never, like, you see him sometimes talk to the FBI, but you never see him, like, carry out. It's, It's totally unclear what he's doing for them, why he's doing it, how it led to any arrests. Like, it's all just this big mystery. I went in with high expectations for the story. I was not going in for the acting, I'll be honest. I was not going in for anybody in this movie other than to see, like, oh, how have we told his story? Mm -hmm. Um, So let me just give you a brief synopsis of, like, what the movie is about, everybody. So basically, this uh, white boy, Rick, is a 14-year-old boy whose dad sells guns legally uh, on paper but they're actually illegally versus their like serial numbers and he sells them with extra parts and silencers and ammunition, stuff like that. So technically it's illegal what his father does, but his father actually sells guns legally, which this is set in Detroit. So remember, everybody is hustling. And I use hustling in the colloquial term, not in like selling drugs or anything like that, but everybody is hustling somebody in Detroit. Right. So white boy Rick um, in the movie, Ricky... His dad is peddling guns, and this kid at 14 is knowing all this stuff about guns, which is not that uncommon for Detroit, uh, lower-income SES. Uh, But then his sister is addicted to drugs, and his sister is supposed to be 16, 17 in this movie. And she doesn't look that. (laughs) She looks much older. But Yeah, she does. It's important to the story that you know that she is very young because of the addiction to drugs and of how much she's experienced and stuff like that for such a young age and how the... Uh, crack epidemic was affecting her. We'll get into why that's important later. Anyway, he is then starting to hang out with some non-favorable crowds, some of the Detroit gangs back in the day. And then the FBI approaches his father and says, hey, be an informant to us and then we'll take care of you. And the dad is like, nobody's a snitch in Detroit. Fuck you, police and FBI. And then they approach approach a 14-year-old boy. The FBI approaches a 14-year-old boy. This is part of the DEA, the FBI, and the Detroit Police Department all made a like, consensus to approach this boy and basically blackmail him, say, we're either going to arrest your father for these illegal drug arms or we are going to allow your father and sister to go free because uh, they were going to arrest his sister for drug use. This is, again, her age. She's very young, so drug use, and we're going to bust your sister... Can I quibble with the blackmail? I mean, isn't that how most people become informants to either as part of a plea or to get out of a deal? So I don't know that blackmail is necessarily fair. Like, that is how the FBI does its thing. In the true story, though, there is more force and pressure put on Rick and himself. So it's probably yes. Okay, that's fair. Um, Because in Detroit, nobody snitches. That is a fact. Like, I don't know if you know people from Detroit, but if you ask anybody about telling the police anything in Detroit, most people are like, oh, nobody talks to the police in Detroit because there's a lot of corruption still today in the Detroit Police Department. Um, But anyway, the FBI approaches this boy and gets him to sell drugs for them. It starts with just buying. But as we know, in drug markets, you cannot buy without selling continuously because then it looks suspicious like you're going to be a narc. So So that, but see, and that part, like, wasn't at all clear in the movie. Like, one day, the FBI's like, now we want you to start selling drugs. And I'm like, what? 
that's crazy town. Like, who made this decision? How is this decision made? Like, there's just... I, I think the movie, like, I, I try to give it credit for, like, maybe wanting to tell the story solely from his point of view and his perspective. Like, he didn't know any of the backstory of this. But leaving out all of the mechanics of what he's doing just made for a very baffling no, I, circumstances. And it was like, yeah. I mean, I'm I, totally on board with that. because like, why, why would they do that? Sitting there in the theater. Uh, and he's 14. Right. The cut shots, it just bothered me to crap. But the cut shots is literally how I feel like the movie was shot. Like, here's the scene. Here's the scene. Here's the scene. Here's the scene. Missing the connecting between the two. What's happening in the story? What's happening with the characters? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And so as we go on through the movie, you know... White Boy Rick starts selling and buying and selling and buying and then decides to hustle on his own for a little bit. And then, you know, that comes back to bite him in the butt because you don't hustle against somebody who you're working for. Yada, yada, yada. We move on to the storyline. He ends up getting shot because he is not deemed trustworthy by uh, the drug dealer he is working for. Which, frankly, he's not. And, right. (laughs) Sort of like, he gets shot for being an informant and he's an informant. But they Am I don't, supposed to yeah. feel bad about it? But they don't this? actually know that. It's all a perceived, you have to, he gets a arrest for a... Yeah, he gets a, out of an arrest really easily. Yeah, he gets a possession charge for having a gun And it's suspicious like how he's like super out of jail right away and they think he's an informant, which is literally what happened. And I was like, yeah, that's about right. Um, so then his dad and him decide that the only way for them to make money and save his sister is to start selling drugs themselves. Right. Which just becomes this crazy warped idea as a parent. Like, the only way to save my family who's on drugs and addicted to drugs is to sell drugs. Okay, great. Um, And so, at the end of the movie... Which gives you this, like, terrible third act of them becoming drug dealers. And, like, I mean, the movie was just a hot mess. I, I, And so, here's where the true story comes into play. How White Boy Rick, uh, Ricky, actually got busted was not by, in the movie, it's this, like, all of a sudden we come to your house and we said, oh, you didn't think we would know you were selling drugs and whatnot. He actually got sold out by one of his gang members because one of his gang members was incarcerated for three months or whatever. Oh, so and they then eventually on made yeah. a plea deal. And when we say nobody in Detroit snitches, that is true. Man did not grow up in Detroit. There's a lot of like controversy around that case because this man who flipped on him then disappears off the map by the FBI and has a new life and has a new start. Nobody knows like really what happens to him after this. Okay. However, when it comes to bat, this is where it gets the movie gets really awful. Everybody, the FBI then is like in this precarious situation where it's like, oh, we entice the 14 year old boy to sell and buy drugs for us. So we could get informants and bust houses and stuff like that. But he got busted for selling drugs. But we're going to do our best to make sure he's not in any harm come the trial and that he doesn't get incarcerated. Uh, Long story short, the FBI doesn't really try. The FBI actually worked in against Rick, the true story, based in the FBI works against Rick and makes up all of these lies saying that we never pushed him, he came to us, blah, blah, blah. This is why everything these days, I tell everybody, get a recording every time. <laughs> Sign a paper. Um, and Rick gets incarcerated. and For life. Rick goes on to be the longest nonviolent offender incarcerated in the state of Michigan. Oh, I think even beyond that. It may be the United States, but yeah. the so, youngest so non-violent Michigan, offender incarcerated for a non-violent crime. Yeah, so and we'll get into to, to this um, later in the podcast, but basically what happens is Michigan, like a lot of states during the 80s, passed draconian drug laws where if you had more than six 650 kilos on you. 250. More than 250 kilos. No, it's, I'm pretty sure it's 650. Okay. Um then you get mandatory life. Uh, so that's how he gets wrapped up. Um, but like on the, just kind of on the technical movie aspects, it just, I mean, poor Matthew McConaughey was trying to do his best to dig this out of a hole that it was in. Um, and he still had a little bit of a Southern accent, which got on my nerves. Yeah. Um, As a Detroit yeah. born and raised man. But 
that kid had no charisma, nothing to him. He, you know, like they made him the star of this film and he was a total blank. But you know why he had no charisma, right? He was literally pulled out of his high school acting class. Never done anything before. Never been a professional actor. They literally, they were trying to go for a raw, drama-confused kid who could literally just read lines off of a script from Detroit. It didn't work. And that's, but that's what you got. You didn't get acting. You didn't get character development. You didn't get anything. This kid literally had the same expression on his face, whether he was happy, sad, shot. Yeah, like. I mean, nothing. <laughs> nothing. And then, so then, so, so he, he comes by the moniker White Boy Rick because he literally is like the only white person in this like drug running community, right? And there's no sense of why anyone in this community would have given him entry either. And because he has no personality or anything, you're like, why did they let him in in the first place? Like, Right. And there is a whole social racial issue entangled into White Boy Rick that I personally am going to stay away from. Not because I don't want to get into it and I think it would be a great discussion, but more like to, uh, I don't want to assume your identity, but white peering people sitting here talking about racial issues, about integration into a black community. Yeah, no. It's not really our scene. Uh, yeah, and we've covered it enough on other, other podcasts. But I think it it's an interesting, there's a whole, why white boy Rick had to be successful to bring this problem to light because, um, I'm sorry, I know where the 220 is coming from now. You're right, it is 600 kilograms. But the 200, white boy Rick was made about a white male to show an injustice in the criminal justice system because it makes white people feel easier about accepting injustice that happened. However, of the 220 people that were released Uh from exoneration in 2014, when the two decades later, when the law was repealed, three of them were like of white descent. Okay. And so we then decided to make a movie about that to make it more comfortable for white people to understand injustice in it. Because, and that pissed me off more than anything. I love the story of White Way Rick, but the whole point of the story was this man was incarcerated for 20-something years. I mean, I feel like the whole point of the story was the FBI recruited a 14-year-old to still, like, buy and sell drugs. And then sent him to prison. Like, like, so, yeah, I... Don't go see this movie. (laughs) Yeah, and so, I mean, there's just... There's a and because the kid can't act. There's a lot of like dramatic music scenes. Like the score of this movie didn't match anything that was going on visually. I was like, when you have these dramatic like classical music moments that have like nothing. I was like, what is? Ha- You're trying to generate an emotion, but the kid's not a good enough actor, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling. And this movie is or this music is totally different from the the visuals itself. I was like, the score was very jarring i well, just and i was counting there's like five subplots in this and none of them got resolved there's a subplot about his sister being a drug addict there's a subplot about his grandfather having alzheimer's there's a subplot about his best friend being an african-american male in the 80s and there's no racial tension between him and anyone else There's a subplot about this 14-year-old, 15 at the time, having a child. We get no resolution, really, with his daughter. And there's a subplot about his dad. Oh, and the daughter. So this was so funny. Like, and all the, like, random things. Oh, and there was a lot of shaky cam. I really dislike shaky cam because it makes me sick. Um, But there is a moment, like, so there's a moment where um, his sister and his baby daughter, who's like, I don't know eight months, nine months at that point are visiting him in jail. And I swear to you, if you go back and look, I think the baby waves to the boom operator. Because there's a moment where the like baby looks up and then just waves at somebody. And I was like, because I'm so disconnected and unemotionally engaged. I'm like, did that baby just wave to the boom operator? It's so bad. I literally thought we were going to, this movie was going to take two parts. One, be the story about how he got incarcerated. And two, about his 20-year stint and what happened there in that time. Because believe it or not, his father from Detroit went to bat for him for years. Got court lawyers, cases, took cases against the FBI. And everybody can talk about conspiracy theories anytime you want. But, like, there was a lot of silencing going on by the FBI during this time. Yeah, so let's, like, kind of dig into the real story. Because, like, honestly, I have nothing good to say about this movie. Like, it just wasn't well made. Um, So... The the father said at the time 
that the FBI hosed us. Like, this is not right. And no one believed him. Um, and the FBI had made sure, like, nothing was on paper, nothing was in writing. Um, they denied ever, like, they denied all involvement. And the, the father just looked like a crackpot conspiracy theorist saying, oh, right. the FBI had my son. Like, so. So diving into the real story, uh, there is a huge still debate between people who work in government, people who work in the FBI, people who follow drug law. Like, this comes up in, like, classes of drug law continuously because we're talking about how do you prove coercion? How do you talk about taking a 14-year-old boy and basically saying, you know, intimidating him to start with? Like, I'm going to take your father to jail. We're going to take your sister away. You'll never see her again. At 14, you're not thinking about, "Mm, what am I going to do? How do I rationalize this? What are my options? You're thinking about shit. I mean, it's consent, right? Like, Like, no 14, like, there's a reason we use that language. Like, no 14-year-old can consent to being an informant to the FBI. They can't. Right. You can't have consent at 14. You You just can't. And they retaliate with, he wasn't actually an informant. This is where it gets a little tricky, everybody. He was not an informant because he was only buying and selling drugs on their behalf, meaning... He wasn't telling anybody. They just knew where the drugs were. And so the FBI wasn't using him as an informant because they could get away with it because they were only using him as a handoff exchange with government funds. And that's this is where it gets tricky. A very fine point that I don't understand. So an informant is someone who you have to support back, document, like protect, stuff like that. Right. So then what is... He? He's some he's, other category a, of thing? He's a drug mule, basically. He's not an informant because he's not telling them where he's buying the drugs, what he's doing. He's just letting them know, I bought and sold drugs at this place. Not who was there, not what they were doing. It becomes a very fine line of like... Okay. And we're sounding like conspiracy theorists. I know it's weird, but like, this is how the FBI writes him off in saying he was basically just doing what we asked. He wasn't telling us any information. Okay. And so then the FBI like is like, well, we taught you how to do this, but you never should have done it on your own. But this is the, the, the point. If he was only doing it for the FBI, they should have kept the money. Allowing a 14-year-old boy to make, in Detroit in the 80s, $9,000 in like, and you know, the movie says kingpin drug 14-year-old. That's not true. He didn't become a drug kingpin. But he did become a very wealthy 14-year-old in the 80s for, you know, $9,000 in like three months. And that's a lot of money for Detroit, especially. I just, it, again, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's baffling to me. It is absolutely baffling to me that adults were involved and anybody thought that this was a thing that they should do like i just i don't i don't understand like how how this happened like what and that i, I i'm just astonished like yeah, it, it it's and you can see why no one believed his dad because it's astonishing like that they even did it in the first place absolutely and the movie does not do the original story any justice because no. A lot of what the movie should have focused on is the time that I think the incarceration would have been a better idea because his dad filed petitions. He met with the FBI. They were in court. Evidence was presented. Judges were denied. And there was a lot of, like, lean back from the FBI saying, like, we had no involvement in this. We didn't teach him how to sell drugs. We asked him to do stuff for us, not teach him how to sell drugs. And what, in all reality, people, like... Go look it up. The history is there online as much as you want to read about it. The FBI took advantage of a 14-year-old boy's immaturity, emotional intelligence, personal intelligence, and really said, hey, you can choose. Never see your family again or do us a favor. And it didn't matter if it was one time or 19,000 times. Once they, he had done it, he was committed to them. Because then the FBI then howled over him Everything like, hey, I will tell everyone in this neighborhood that you're part of a narc. So it becomes a double-edged sword where like, my life is no longer safe. I have to work both sides because if I don't, I'll be called a narc and I will be killed. If I say no to the FBI, if I say no to my people, they'll wonder why I'm out and also want to kill me. So this becomes a very 
60s through 2010 Detroit era that we saw a huge number of people die from drug-related incidents that were not drug overdoses, from suspicion, narking, uh, mistrust, misuse, losing money. And so it becomes this whole perpetual cycle of like, this isn't about anything other than how Detroit in the 80s took into account what they wanted to see was a drug-enforced policy. And that becomes this problem for the FBI because they then took advantage of a 14-year-old boy and, in my opinion, literally ruined the lives of no less than 10 people directly affected by it, his family and his uh, partner and his child and their children. And so this is not a story that you go see this movie and everybody's like, people are going to think this is fiction when they watch the movie because it did not do a good job of explaining all what's happening. But it also, like, okay, so, like every, you know, like most people in America, I am now an expert on the drug trade because I watched all five (laughs) seasons of The Wire, right? So now I know everything there is to know, right? Although, I mean, I will say, like, it's a pretty good education if, I feel like if you do The Wire and Justified, (laughs) you'll you'll know a lot. You've got the, like, (laughs) rural white people drugs, you've got the, like, inner city black people drugs, you're pretty covered on drug trade. But, I mean, it does sort of get into the the war on drugs. I mean, the big push in the 80s between our opi- opioid crisis now in terms of how now all of a sudden we think there should be a kinder, kinder gentler treatment to, towards the opioid crisis. But when we had the crack epidemic, everybody was like harsh drug laws. And, and, and I do think... I would never say there's not an element of racism there. There's There certainly is. Absolutely. Um, but I do also think, like, the war on drugs has been, like, we lost the war. Like, it's it's been extremely unsuccessful, and I think that people know that. And I think people are realizing that it's... keeping a, sem- a, what are you, 17 by the time we got sentenced? Like, keeping a 17-year-old kid in jail for the rest of his life serves zero purpose. We live in a model of punishment where we think that delayed punishment will help you understand your crime. When we know from research that punishment needs to be immediate, uh, severe, and personal. And that's literally we know from research that's what works best. And so like delayed sentences of life sentences and stuff like that doesn't teach people anything, everybody. And I'm not saying let's let people out who are on life sentences because some people deserve to be and you can't see me locked up for the rest of their lives. I'm quoting that because I don't necessarily think prison is the only option for locked up. I think there are other mental health centers that people could go to. Whatever. We're not getting into mental health today. However, this movie literally could have been a shiny example of all the things you talk about. Let's talk about the crack epidemic in the 80s. Let's talk about how severe, and we see, you know, his sister's the only really drug user we see Right, and it's and they kind of gloss over this, but in the movie, it's clear that she's moved on to heroin. Right, she, she well, her list of drugs that she states herself was right. So it's like she, they kind of confound. I mean, I'm sure it's true that she she in the story, but it's like they confound her being the, the they confound the crack epidemic, but then her being like a heroin addict. Yeah, well, they, bit, it looks like she starts with meth because that's why all her lip is broken up and stuff like that, and then she's on crack, and then she's on like, but like we find her in a heroin house. Oh my there's, gosh, I feel so dumb. Was there meth in the eighties? <laughs> Unfortunately, not until nineties. Uh, meth has been around Forever, for a long time probably. from different names. Hi y'all, do you know that I don't know that much about drugs? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I worked at a drug clinic. Maybe so. Yeah. Uh, um, um, yeah. So we really, we saw no little about the drug epidemic, which I think was a huge selling point for the movie. Could have been like, look at the 80s. Look what was happening. Look how desperate look people were. Look how bad were this went. Yeah. yeah. And then the response to that, I think you could have summed it up all about, the, I thought his story could have been summed up into like, 45 minutes. There was so many unnecessary scenes. We go to Vegas. It was stupid. He Oh, the Vegas thing was terrible. Uh, there was no reason for them to go to Vegas. Um, and so I thought we could have summed up his story in 45 minutes, talked about the crack epidemic, talked about him getting incarcerated based on a bullshit law that was come down to basically, and this is a racially profiling law, as most of them were, to come down super hard on people who were moving, selling drugs, of certain ethnicities because of the quantities, because white people never got charged with quantities, usually just 
dis- uh, not distribution, but usually just possession of small amounts. There's a lot of evidence that there was tampering with of evidence back in the 80s for white individuals. Um, not saying it's fair. I'm just noting a fact. And then moved on to 20 years in prison. This kid never gave up hope, never lost end to, because he was in solitary confinement most of his time due to his racial differences because he, they thought he was a narc. Right. And if he would have been put in gen pop most of the time, he would have been most likely killed, as we know is true for individuals of racially different profiles who think who have narked on other racially. Or if they were, in fact, narcs. Yeah, or if they were. <laughs> like, in fact, um, which he was. But they didn't know. But, Still but, but oddly, yeah. like, that it was weird because they didn't protect them. Yeah, I think, so one of the things that I was having a conversation with a friend of mine um, who unfortunately, uh, who works in the restaurant industry, which still is very much run on Coke. <laughs> um, and we were we were talking about, like, lots of stuff about heroin and now the opioid epidemic. But one of the things that I was saying, you know, like, we, when we were talking about Coke, like, and one of the things that it really does make, could have made this interesting and, and a really unique topic is, the thing is, cocaine doesn't kill you. Absolutely. So you can just keep doing it. And you don't have the death toll, but then you have this tremendous social cost, like this tr- tremendous, um, you know, the crime and the guns and all and money laundering and all the things that come come with having, you know, like an illegal substance yeah. and all the and how it tore up communities while not killing people be- other than through the crime. And I'm like, that's a really I, I just I don't feel like that gets talked about enough and like I, I yeah I, I was really disappointed because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of territory to mine in terms of like what the war on drugs didn't accomplish and how horrible it was and how yeah for nonviolent offenders like got put in prison forever but the war on drugs was meant to be a white person dictating how drugs are affecting communities of peoples of color and what they wanted to see off the streets. The war on drugs never came for white people. No, of course not. And the war on drugs didn't come for white people doing more illicit drugs than people of color who were doing less illicit drugs. The yeah, war on like drugs, fact, yeah. white drug use is just as common as black drug use, and yet the arrest rates are significantly lower. Yeah. So we're not in, I don't want to deny any of that. And I don't want to take away from that because I, if you're listening to this podcast now, I really want you to know that like, that is something I'm very passionate about. We could do a whole nother podcast not related to movies on the war on drugs, everybody. But what I want you to understand is this movie was made to help white people feel better about the 1980s drug war on the war on drugs and be like, oh, white people, look at this injustice that was going on when you could have shot this movie from the perspective of the other 219 people who were affected by this law in the 80s, who were released from incarceration in 2014, who were not, uh, excuse me, there's little numbers difference there. It's about 215 who are not white appearing. So this didn't affect primarily white people, but we made a movie about White Boy Rick because it's easier for audiences to digest and white people to understand that this happened and injustices aren't happening because a white person experienced it versus the true story is those 215 individuals who are people of color, most predominantly African-American, who experienced being caught up in a 1980s law that was passed by the war on drugs to help white people feel more safe and better. And that's bullshit. Uh... And I think that this movie missed the hallmark on being able to nail anything about that and instead wanted to appease audiences with a story. And the only reason he gets more attention than anybody else on that list is because he was the youngest offender. However, the next youngest offender was African-American. And the offender after that was African-American. I could go on and on and on saying that these are not... These, this movie was to prove a point. And I think... Rick's story is amazing because it does go into a lot of depth about how, if you actually look at his incarceration, how well he survived and how well he kept it together mentally, but also how well his father fought for him every step of the way. And he still wanted to be engaged and all this. And we could talk about all the great things about Rick. But I think what it missed is being able to say this is not just affecting him. This is affecting more people than we know. 
And two decades later, we reversed a decision to improperly incarcerate individuals because we were upset with how drugs were moving through communities in Detroit. Yeah, I think to me, I think the story to me, which would have, if you wanted to tell the story, I, I didn't, I don't take, I didn't take the message quite so harshly as you did. Um, and I think it's just a matter of interpretation. I'm not saying you're right and I'm wrong or vice versa. But to me, I thought this movie was really going to be about like, again, not only did the drugs and the drug trade tear through communities in really, really, really damaging ways, Absolutely. but, and then the draconian drug laws, again, you know, just, just create this, you know, overpopulation that we still have in our prison system, but it also led the cops to do, or the cops, not even, like, law enforcement, like, I mean, the CIA has got his real hands dirty with buying cocaine, like, Mm -hmm. you've got the CIA, the FBI, the Detroit police, like you said, like, look at all the things that law enforcement was doing in the name of the war on drugs that was so... Unethical, unethical, unconscionable, like just so beyond the norm of what anyone can justify as being okay. But they thought at the time they were being righteous. And in the movie, the best redeeming quality I had for that is the FBI was portrayed by two white, one white male, one white female individuals who were dictating the shots of how the war on drugs came about. And I thought that was the best piece because they included then a police officer. A who, Detroit, yeah. Who was African American. And he was the realest person in the whole movie to me. He didn't want to take the kid's attitude. He wasn't really for the idea, but he was being pushed by the FBI to do this. And there's a lot of history there with the Detroit police and cooperation and collusion and, you know. Yeah, I mean, part of. So part of what he does is bring down the Detroit police. Yeah. Like, that is why the FBI is involved, because they know the, the Detroit police are corrupt and they're trying to catch the dirty cops. Then we all know I hate cops, so... If anybody's listening, you know, Detroit police today may have their problems. They are doing a better job than they've ever done before, so I want to salute that. But as with every police department, there's always problems. No, nah, I just not. <laughs> I'm anti-law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> Law enforcement, the military, and someday I promise the other Garrett we're going to do a podcast about why I hate doctors. Um, I yeah, and so I think I think that this is a story that needed to be told. I think there's still so much more to come out of it. Like this is one random kind of little event, but they don't. But this could have been told as a mockumentary. Um, you know, it can't be told as a documentary because oh my god, show. that would be so weird. But like, you know, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that idea, like. It's, I don't mean it in like a satirical way, but like it can't be told as a documentary so much because like his dad's dead, like, you know, his grandparents are dead. Like there's not a whole lot of people still living who remember everything that was going on. So I, while I'd love a documentary from Rick's point of view, he's 14. We know that 14 year olds aren't the best historians either. So I would love, I wanted more. I wanted, I didn't want Matthew McConaughey, mud, Dallas Buyers Club character coming to Detroit, because that's exactly what I got from Yeah. I, I didn't want a kid who had never had any acting experience, who didn't smile pretty much the entire movie. Yeah, that movie. kid stunk. I didn't want... I, th- I thought the sister had the best acting throughout the whole thing. Cause the you, two English people in this movie nailed the Detroit accent better than... Yeah. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> I wanted more from Rick with the integration into the African American community, because I think that's a piece we missed in the movie. It just all of a sudden was like, hey, we're all of a sudden friends. When that's not how the true story goes. The true story says Rick went to the same... I assume they met in school, but they never tell you. Right. He met a guy in school who told him to come see the guy he was working for. So there's this whole building of relationship with somebody uh, in the 80s of a different color in Detroit, which is a huge deal. And I think we should have hit on that more. Um, But what this movie missed was plot, character development... The cinematography was awful. I literally sat in a dark movie theater wishing there was more lights just so I could see half the film. Like, oh, yeah. And the, the use of gray gel is like, we get it. Detroit is depressing. Thank you very much. Like, you're not the first person to portray it that way. And as bad as Detroit is, they portrayed Detroit in the 80s as, like, literally a war zone sometimes. Like, we were looking at houses and stuff like that. And as bad as Detroit is... 
it's like, okay, Detroit also has some good pieces. Don't just focus. We only saw pieces of, like, broken I'm houses. I'm making this total face of skepticism because I've been through Detroit, and that, was that like, the vacant lot thing is real at Circa, Sure, like, in, like, the 2000s, not the 80s. No, I, I think, anyway. Um, but also it was Cleveland, so it was... Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that you bring up, like, the... I think the real flaw that we both agree on, however you want to characterize it, is it it tried to tell, like, one person's story who got, you know, swept up in a bad situation and paid a huge cost for it when the better movie and the better story and the real interest of examining this one person's story is to show the systemic problems that were at work. I agree. And they didn't know how to do that and so then they sort of kind they kind of just make it again oh two rogue fbi agents who f this up and you're like they just they 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 gloss over all the systemic stuff other than some like ridiculously heavy-handed race things which were horrible which literally we could do a whole podcast on but i would need a third party to be here because i just it it, it just no i mean yes but also as a white person like it was really ridiculously heavy-handed race stuff and i was like this is annoying and you're not doing these people any service by just being like you know if a black person got arrested this would have gone really differently like thank you that for that cogent deep analysis of race relations in Detroit in the 80s. Really appreciate it. As we said before, we are not the people to sit here and talk about racial issues as two white appearing individuals. So that's a whole conversation for another time. I, we would love to hear from you in the comments and reach out. We were more than happy to engage in dialogue with that. But it's the whole movie was just the letdown from what the amazing turnover of a law two decades later of a draconious drug law in the 80s overturned. And then Rick is now out and free. What they don't, like, they literally blurb you at the end of the movie. Narratives, like, this is what everybody's doing. Dad died. Rick's out. And then they play, the last thing they played you is one of the most famous um, quotes. It's from him giving a phone oh, interview. Oh, yeah, yeah. You get to hear his real voice. You get to nice. hear his real voice. And he still sounds like a 14-year-old boy. And I just want to draw your attention to that being locked up in prison for almost 20 years. His mentality hasn't changed. And I feel like that's what you're missing. Is like he was incarcerated for 20-something years and not able to, like, have really communicative processes with anybody other than, like, you know, that once-weekly visit and whatnot. So... We missed a huge mark on this movie. I was super excited. I was the one who recommended this movie to Nicole. I was like, let's go see this. This is based on a true story. I followed this. I'm so into this. And I walked away feeling like, hmm, I've literally like done nothing for two and a half hours and thought that was better time spent. Yeah. It, it was not good. No. So on that note, do we want to quick sum up our social impact score with a very terrible score of... You know, I think it's like a one. This movie was zero, bad. being not in any impact <laughs> well, at all. Let's go the... from one to ten. As much as I've tried to give a zero or negative numbers before, the lowest is is the one. I gave it a two point five because at least it brought people to the attention of the drug laws in the eighties. But that's as much social impact as I'm willing to get to it. If people really wanted to know more about the movie, I encourage you to go out to the history online. And if you don't I haven't seen the movie yet, don't. I will you, post some links to, to some of the true story stuff yeah, in the show notes. Um, that that would be much a better use of your time than actually seeing this movie. Yes. Do you have recommendations for this week? I do. Okay, so I have two recommendations this week. Um, and one, I think the recommendation is super important, uh, is that you actually read a real story about incarceration. So it's called Actual Innocence, Five Days to execution and other dispatches from the wrongly convicted and is written by barry sheck peter nofeld and jim dwyer and we'll post that in the comments you can buy it on amazon in paperback you do not need the hardcover which i have which is amazing but you don't need it it's like 13 dollars on amazon and it goes through actual stories of people who have been wrongly convicted and what happens to them in their time in prison and uh, the main story is about this man who is five days from execution before he gets exonerated. So I think it's a wonderful read. Um, that is my first recommendation. 
My second recommendation is because I didn't know what else to recommend here. I'm going to recommend The Count of Monte Cristo. I love um, the book. But, I love a revenge. Uh, you guys know if you heard our Murder in the Orient Express episode, I love a revenge story. Yeah. Love them. Um, Alexander Dumas is the writer, and I think it just... If you want to talk about wrongly incarceration in fiction, I think The Count of Monte Cristo is a great place to start. And the third place I want to recommend is not necessarily a book or a movie. I want to recommend you spend at least 20 minutes of your life Googling the war on drugs, the 1980s, the draconious drug laws, things that actually impacted that you're seeing are turned over now in your lifetime. If you weren't alive in the 80s, that's fine. If you were alive in the 80s, then you know. <laughs> like if you weren't alive in the 80s, what are you doing listening to this <laughs> but, but Rock on, young people. We, we love all our listeners, but like we do. you either lived through it, you knew about it, or you were not a part of it. Either way. But go spend some time actually learning about your history and learning what's happening in the world around you and why people are fighting so hard right now against the second war on drugs, I like to call it against marijuana, or the war on opioids, or the war on anything else, and look at pharmaceutical companies and see where the money's going, and then tell me if it's a war or if it's a financial choice. So I have, I do actually have a recommendation this week. Um, It's one that is going to stink for almost everybody who listens to this, and I apologize. So I was fortunate enough through a friend connection to get a ticket to Hamilton playing in DC last week. And I honestly felt like there is literally no way this musical can live up to the hype. I saw Book of Mormon and I hated it. I didn't think the music was that good. And I thought the whole thing of it was offensive. Like I was PO'd. Um, Y'all Hamilton is, is that good. It totally lives up to its hype. It's amazing. And I'm not a huge musicals person either. Like it's, outstanding and you should see it if it's near you i paid an egregious sum of money but not uh like gave my right arm sum of money um worth every penny so if the touring company is coming to you go see hamilton yeah it's it really is i couldn't i, I can't believe it was as good as everybody said it was like it just seemed like it couldn't live up to it and it did okay so we hope you enjoyed this episode of movies that matter Leave a review. We love reviews. Um, find us on our website, moviesthatmatterpodcast.com. You know, I'm going to put links to things in our show notes. If you want to talk to us, we have a Facebook page. We're on Twitter, at Movies Matter Pod. And remember, movies matter. And so do you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>